Good morning to those of you who are visiting with us online. We're always glad to have you join us. I want to invite all of us to turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 5. If you would, please, that will be the source of our study this morning. The story that is divulged or revealed in this Acts chapter 5 might be one of the most candid and vivid in the entire book of Acts. There's a lot of pretty stark stories in Acts, but it's a story that demonstrates the honesty of the scriptures. And I thought about this, and maybe you've thought about it too, that if, if, I, was, if I was putting together the book of Acts as Dr. Luke was, Luke is the author of Acts, I think I would have probably made an editorial decision to delete this story or at least to make it not look quite so bad, to kind of alter it just a bit. Not that you would lie, just put it in a different perspective. But the Word of God, if you've been in it very much at all, you have noticed that it is, it's very straightforward. And sometimes the Word of God is painfully frank and this is one of those times, this Acts chapter 5. There, in Acts chapter 5, there is no hiding the truth. Something very troublesome is happening in the church, and it's dealt with in a very open and forthright manner. There's no sugarcoating. There's no whitewashing. This is what you can call a real no-spin zone. Acts chapter 5. It is what it is. And in this case, the it is not very pretty. In fact, the it is quite ugly. You'll know what the it is here in just a moment as we read together. But this Acts chapter 5 is also a classic instance, I believe, where we see the sovereignty of God a God who is somehow, some way, causing all things to work together for the good for those that love him. So as we draw today from Acts chapter 5, I've titled this sermon, Let's Be Real. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37 closes with a very powerful picture of the early church standing united with one heart and one soul. You can read those closing verses of chapter 4. And then as chapter 4 comes to an end, we hear about a guy named Joseph. He's a uh, Cypriote. He's uh, got a nickname that you know him better as called Barnabas. And it simply closes, chapter 4 does, by saying that Barnabas sold a tract of land and laid the funds at the feet of the apostle. In other words, this is to help the church in whatever way. And then as we begin Acts chapter 5, it seems like it starts on a very positive note in that what we read in verse 4, a certain man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. It's kind of like what Barnabas did uh, is now going to ricochet into another good deed or redound into another good deed. Something good has spurred the, the good deeds of Barnabas stirred the good deeds of Ananias and Sapphira. So that's the way chapter 5 begins, but as we read from chapter 5 and verse 2, then we see that something has gone sour. It's not enough that we read that Ananias and Sapphira sold some property, like Barnabas, but then we read verse, verse 2 of chapter 5. They kept back some of the price for them for himself Ananias did with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it 
he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, there's an assumption that's being made here that <clears throat> they were presenting the idea that we sold the property and this is what we sold it for and you can have it all. I say that's a presumption, but as you read through the story, there's, there's nothing wrong. If some of you have a piece of property you want to sell and benefit the church, there's nothing wrong with anybody selling a piece of property and saying, you know, I'm going to give half of this to the church or I'm going to give a third of this or selling something. Maybe you sell your house and you give a certain percentage of what's made from the house to the church. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no rule in the Bible that says, oh, no, you either give it all or don't give it any. But there is something wrong if you pretend to give the whole thing, but you're holding back. And that's what verse 2 indicates to us is that they held back for themselves. So let's uh, continue and we'll, we'll read this uh, chapter beginning at verse 3 and we'll go through verse 10. <clears throat> Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back some of the price for the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your mind or in your heart? You have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. And he heard these words, as Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. And the young men arose and covered him up and carried him out, and they buried him. And there elapsed an interval of about three hours. And his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And then Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together, you and your husband, to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out as well. And she fell immediately at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. What a story. And as I told you, uh, how helpful it might have been to just not tell the world about this side of the church life in Jerusalem, but Acts chapter 5 tells it just like it is. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 11 is what we might call a postscript to this event. And it notes, not surprisingly, great fear came upon the whole church and upon everybody who heard about these things. Well, sure it would. Talk about stirring people onto walking a chalk line as to being honest with God. But this was not a paralyzing fear, I don't think, but it was rather a, a sense of shock and awe that I think served to awaken and sharpen the early church. And it keenly impressed upon them the realization that they were serving an omniscient God, a God who knows all, a God who sees all. And they were serving an omniscient God, an all-knowing God, <clears throat> who did not then, and I would say to us, and does not now, a God who does not tolerate dishonesty and deception, nor half-heartedness and hypocrisy. That's good to be afraid of that. <clears throat> 
to have that knowledge in you, if it causes fear, more power to it. Because our God sees all. He knows all. And we better act and respond and behave aware that God knows everything. So the church at Jerusalem came to comprehend very early on that it was impossible to hoodwink the Almighty God. You could not pull a fast one on God. And this is a a very important lesson. It's what we might call Christianity 101. It's a lesson that makes crystal clear, makes it crystal clear that following Christ, to follow Christ is a very serious undertaking that requires sincerity and truthfulness and the kind of behavior that is what we might call beyond reproach. We're acting before a watching world and an ever-watching creator and sustainer. The actions of Ananias and Sapphira were clearly noted as being sins against against God. We oftentimes sin against one another, and even when we sin against one another, the big deal about the sin is that it's a sin against God. All sins are sins against God. I'll belabor that point sometime down the road. Now, I know I'm a weirdo in some ways, but I want to say to you that I think, even though it might sound strange, that I'm very encouraged by this story in Acts chapter 5. From a personal point of view, if I was Luke, I would have thought about editing it. Maybe not. But I, now that I read it, I'm encouraged by this story because to me it shows us that even in the heyday of the early church, the church was a mixture of good and bad. Sometimes we forget that. So I think it would do us all well to remember that the, the, the church, if it required a whole, everybody in it to be a group of perfect people, there would have been no church at all. Jesus could not have started his church if everybody in it was required to be perfect. So the early saints we read in this story, they were seized. My translation uses that term. But they were not seized up. And there's a difference. There was no work stoppage. In fact, just the opposite took place. There was a great increase. You can see that when we come to the end of the story today. These early Christians here in the church in Jerusalem, they did not allow this incident to drive them into hibernation or hiding. Sometimes we have things happen in the church and we just think, how can we go on? How can we even face anybody? So this morning I want to continue our series on Christian, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to talk to us again, I think I say again because I believe that we've touched on this some over the last couple of months. But I want to talk to us about the virtue of authenticity. Now, I don't know. I know you can you can be real even if you're bad. You know, somebody can be really bad. The, the, to the cultivation of these virtues that we're after is we follow in the steps of Jesus. Acts chapter 5 tells us much about this church. They worship openly. Some others, leaders among the Jews, feared to associate with them, but the people held them in high esteem. And verse 14 of Acts 5 says, Multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Acts chapter 5 and verse 17 gives us a little snapshot of the tenacity of their young faith as a church in Jerusalem. The apostles, in particular here, Peter and John, as we open chapter 3 and chapter 4, Peter and John are imprisoned. 
These are two leaders among the apostles. And subsequently, and without the approval of the Jewish leaders, uh, they are released from prison uh, by a messenger, an angel from God. They're locked in behind bars, and an angel comes along and comes and tells them that they're going to be set free, and they are set free, and they're directed by the angel or the messenger they, who tells them, go your way, stand and speak. And they did just that, Peter and John. If you had been in prison, you might say, well, I think we ought to go home and calm down a little while. No, they stood and spoke. They did the very thing that caused them to be thrown into prison. And it says then that they were brought back before the Jewish Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court. And after being reprimanded, Peter and the apostles answered these Jewish leaders by saying, we must obey God rather than men. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. Peter wouldn't back down. And Peter's sermon, which sometimes sermons are called apologies, it's a Greek word, apologia, which doesn't mean please forgive me for what I'm about to tell you in this sermon. It's here's my defense. This is why I'm telling you what I'm telling you. That's what the word apologia started out to mean. So Peter's sermon offended the Jewish leaders. You see this in verse 33. I'm in chapter 5 and we'll go to verse 33. Uh, Peter stood up to preach a few verses before 33. When they, the they is the Jewish leaders, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. Now, sometimes in Scripture, we read the expression that people listen to a sermon and they're cut to the heart. That's a good thing. We see that in Acts 2.38, when they're listening to Peter preach and they are cut to the heart and they ask, what must we do? And Peter says, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But being cut to the quick is not the same as being cut to the heart. To be cut to the quick means that sermon really irritates you. And you would like to do away with the speaker <laughs> to be more uh, blunt about it. So they were cut to the quick and they had every intention, the text tells us, of slaying the apostles. They were thinking in dire terms here. Now, a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel intervened and he shared some anecdotal illustrations from his lifetime of learning and speaking. And he advised them. This is found in verse 34, and I'm giving you the text and it's online if you want to read in more detail. But it's a great study to occupy much of your week if you want it to. He says, and uh, Gamaliel says to these uh, Jewish leaders, look, if it's of God, if Peter and John healing people and them getting better, and if them doing all of these miracles and preaching all of this stuff, it's, if it's really from God, Gamaliel tells them, then you're not going to be able to overthrow them. And if you do try to overthrow them, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. Is that what you want to do? He's appealing to the mindset of his fellow Jewish leaders. So they took his advice. Doesn't always happen, but in this case they did. And they did not kill the apostles. But they just flagged them. That is, we've got you in our records. We have flagged your record. And we know that you're a troublemaker. They not only flagged them, but the text says they flogged them. A flogging was nothing to shake a stick at. It was a serious uh, a punishment. So the apostles were flagged and then flogged and sent on their way with the word, the warning, speak no more in the name of this Jesus. You see that in verse 40. And they released them. And they ended up being, to borrow some of Vic's fishing language, a case of catch and release. They had caught them, 
the Jewish leaders had caught the apostles doing things that they clearly disliked. They put them in jail, but now at the advice of Gamaliel, they're releasing him. Now this story ends not with a whimper, but with a bang. So hold on just a little bit more. The apostles and these early Christians refused to be intimidated. They were seized by shock and awe at the actions of the Almighty. But even a chapter earlier, the threats and the machinations of the Jewish leaders failed to sway them to be quiet. These early saints had prayed for boldness and they were now bolder than ever. They were not going to be strong-armed into being quiet. They were not going to be muzzled or muted. These first century saints kept on keeping on. <clears throat> what an inspiration it is to read Acts 5 and verse 41. They went on their way. They went on their way, it says, rejoicing. They went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were considered worthy to suffer for his name. They didn't leave with their tail between their legs, crying, woe is us. They went on their way rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer in the name of Christ. They rejoiced because their persecutions, even though not tasteful, provided them with an occasion to share in what Christ had to happen to him. And that was an expression of their loyalty to Christ, that they could follow in his train. They rejoiced because their sufferings provided for them a real occasion to share in the experience of Jesus, these early saints. And Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 2. You can read about it. For you have been called for this purpose, 1 Peter 2, 21 and following, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. And in his case, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering threats, he gave no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him, that is the Father, who judges righteously. How, I think how on this subject of authenticity, this virtue might well be one of the most important ones that we can pursue. And I think how urgent it is for us to, to get this message. So whatever, let's just translate this into some more generic language, but we can relate to it. I don't think we can relate to being in prison for doing a good deed. But let's relate it in other ways. When, when we face trials and tribulations or problems and perchance should we be prosecuted or persecuted, when we face sorrows and sufferings, Oh, here's one that we all have, headaches and heartaches. Seldom does a week go by that we don't suffer some of those. All of these, all of these provide us with a vehicle to witness to God's sovereignty and to our loyalty. And loyalty is part of the concept of authenticity. So in the face of trials, the question is really twofold. Are we going to remain loyal? Will we prove to be loyal, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? And maybe secondly, will we, will we keep on rejoicing? Will negative events and bad people steal away our joy and rob us of our smile? Or will we with genuine determination and devotion keep on 
walking in the steps of Jesus. Finally, this great chapter closes with these words. Chapter 5, verse 42, Tracy read them. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching that Jesus was the Christ. <clears throat> Their faith was not simply a garment that they wore on Sundays. Their faith was a daily demonstration. It could be seen at the temple for sure, the text tells us, but it could also be seen at home. It was a faith that permeated their homes throughout the week. And we have all thought at times, Vic's class this morning, if you missed it, it was really good. And he touched on this. There are many people out there in the world who have been turned off by some of us who are in here in the church. Because they have seen us behave one way on Sunday <clears throat> and then in totally different ways, in totally incongruous ways on Monday, Tuesday, or throughout the whole week. Now, I have said to you before, and I'll say it again here briefly, that there's room in the family of God for weakness. Thank goodness. Otherwise, none of us would be here. But there is no place for insincerity and hypocrisy. And hypocrisy isn't defined by just goofing up occasionally. And we all do that. There's not a one of us in here who at times has not behaved incongruously. We say one thing, but we don't always do what we say. That doesn't necessarily make us a hypocrite. What makes us a hypocrite is when we do that on a regular basis, and we don't have any qualms about doing it. We play the charade of being one thing on Sunday and another thing on Monday as if it's okay. And it's not okay. We might stumble at it from time to time, but we know in our heart of hearts as God's children, it's not okay to be duplicitous. It's not okay to be inauthentic. We have got to be real. So stumble though we may from time to time, we must will, will to be real. We've got to, all of us have to aspire to be real. One last paragraph. To not be authentic is first and foremost to sin against God. I don't know if there's any sin that hurts God more than to see his children not being real. To be disingenuous also places not only a sorrow in the heart of God, but a stumbling block in the, in the lives of some of those who have the, are looking at us and maybe a, provides a stumbling block that sometimes does, has the potential to do some serious and irreparable damage. I would venture to say that we all know somebody out there now who used to be in here but somehow something hypocritical or something not authentic drove them out because they couldn't stand to be in the face of such double-mindedness. So it's not a small thing to not be real. It can cause some people to be driven away from the Lord, and we don't want to be responsible for that. We Christians are to be a reflection of Christ. And when we Christians who are claiming to follow Christ are not real, that which ought to be about us, a savor or a aroma that is wafting forth as a sweet scent can quickly become an odious stench. 
That's how important it is to be real. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for our gathering today. Thank you for the word which is indeed sometimes painfully uh, frank. And as we read this story from the book of Acts, remind us that you want us to walk honestly and upright and to be real in all that we do. And Father, we want to be that and we know that we stumble and we pray that you'll forgive us but help us all band together to help encourage each other to be genuine and sincere in all that we do and may our actions our real lives bring you honor and glory that's our goal through christ we pray amen This morning, if you're not a child of God and you want to become a child of God and you're ready to be baptized and you know that that's a step that you want to take that brings you to be clothed with Christ, if we can help you in that way or in some other way, maybe some of you are saying, man, I have got to get real. I've got to make my life harmonize with what I want to be as a Christian. You can respond publicly, but you can also take care of that in your own private life and say, you know, sometimes we feel like we want to announce it to others and have them help us in our prayer, and that's sometimes very helpful, but sometimes you know what you're doing wrong, and you just need to go about getting serious. And you can go home today and say, I'm resolved to change. I want to be real. Let's all stand and sing and then meditate on this thought throughout not only the rest of the day, but the week.